podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Okay, Welcome back to episode 101. Um, and what we're going to be talking about this time, Bob, is working with the isolated client. I love that. You know, I love the numerals 101. And I love them because I think it's uh, to do with the co- a two-day course I teach on the concepts of transaction analysis. And it's called 101 course. Yeah. And I, I've been teaching it for 37 years. <gasps> Is that how long you've been doing it, Bob? Well, I remember that as if it was yesterday. Well, there we are. I was so nervous and so anxious about not only coming into Cholton, because I don't like big towns and things like that, but actually walking into the Institute. It was like walking in the first day at school. Yeah, that 101. 101s usually are with about 14 to 16 people. Yeah. They're learning the early concepts of transaction analysis. Um, and I used to love teaching that course. I still do. I don't do as many now. Uh, my colleagues do them more. But it was one of my favourite two-day courses. So when you said 101, I just like that thought because it made me think about all the 101s I've taught. Yeah, and you must have done a fair few over 37 years, Bob. Certainly 101 of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So well, the yeah. isolated client. Yeah, and I was thinking about this. It's it's a fabulous topic, and it's also a it's an interesting topic for therapists because it's one of the major questions that the therapist needs to ask about their 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 clients. They need to know how isolated they are. In other words, they're need... having a support network. Correct. Okay. Yeah, in, in in any assessments that you do, and I do a lot of assessments before I pass them on to therapists, I will always ask um, and inquire about a person's support system. Yeah. Because when they isolate themselves or are alone or live alone, they tend not to have the same sort of support networks or they are what I call self-reliant loners. Yeah means that they're people who rely basically on their internal self and if that internal self is pretty negative then um you know it, it's not a good indicator of health no mental health i'm talking about yeah absolutely and so, i think that support network is vital particularly when when you're in therapy mm-hmm. So there's several questions I ask. That's one of them. You know, I'm always looking at, you know, the capacity um, clients have for play and humour as well. But I am I think making checking out their levels of support and how isolated they are is really important in terms of mental health indicators. Yeah. And um, in some ways... That will shape the therapy. Yeah. So how how would you be different with a client if you found out that they didn't really have a support network, that they were on their own? What would be different? Well, that information would be an indicator for me around the type of therapy in terms of um, certainly start off with individual therapy, but we'd be looking at how come a person's arrived in that position in other words have they decided that they that isolation is the best way for them to survive yeah so through choice yeah yeah Yeah. has it come from an isolated childhood yeah um is it the way that they see the world is um, this self-reliant, what I call self-reliance loner, a, a, a way of um, living the world for them? And what does that mean for them? So, yeah. you know, I, I need to start learning about their script. In other words, how they become the, 
this way today. Yeah. They've had choices in life been that they've ended up isolating themselves. Yeah. And how do they understand that for themselves? Yeah. I also, also always think about stroke theory. So for TA, non-TA people listening, stroke is a sort of, you know, means in TA language, um, you know, you have positive strokes, negative strokes, but basically it, it, it's a unit of social recognition, a stroke, whether it's positive or negative. And strokes are a bit like oxygen. We yeah. Need them. Yeah. We don't have positive strokes, so we look for negative strokes because they're units of recognition. Yeah. If we don't have them, we usually, it's not long before we, you know, move away from a sense of reality. If you go into any uh, prisons or any sort of torture regimes, um, locking a person away in solitude yeah. know, is, is what they do. Yeah. Absolutely. And even with, with young babies or whatever, you know, it's failure to thrive if they're not getting the a, another human connection. We we are, you know, sociable creatures, human beings. We 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 like to be around other people. That's correct. Unless, of course, in our histories, yeah. It's dangerous to be social. Yeah. And then we survive by being isolated and relying yeah. only on ourselves. Because outside relying on ourselves, it's not been safe. Yeah. So we've had a history that's been so toxic and traumatic that being social is dangerous. And that gives us an understanding of the isolation of the person and what that means. Yeah. So it's, you know, on a positive note, it's really good if they do come in the therapy room because they're, they're wanting something to change. I know the, the last podcast episode was about change, you know, so noticing maybe that they are on their own too long. Because, you know, there's loads of television programmes and films about, you know, people being a recluse and, you know, never coming out the house and all that sort of stuff usually because there has been some past trauma or they've been repeatedly let down or or whatever it is you know I, I don't know there's 101 different reasons but it's always seen in a really negative light usually that type of person is seen as eccentric yeah yeah that type of person is withdrawn isolating themselves is seen as you know antisocial eccentric odd all those words yeah yeah now, that person to actually come to therapy now i know we're in a continuum uh, mental health continuum here but for that person to come into therapy that's isolated withdrawn um hasn't got a support network you have to then think oh crikey so how come they've got motivation to actually want to change in the first place yeah or actually to pick up the phone to recognise that their needs aren't being met at some level, recognise that the discomfort, uh, there's more to life perhaps, all those things they might say to themselves, you know, that it's very positive indicators if they can come to therapy. Often those people, by the way, are often sent to therapy or or, or, or their friends tell them they need therapy or... yeah. Uh, and sometimes they might realise themselves that it's not yeah. helping. They're so, so they're so sort of isolated. Or um, now, you know, I also think that when the th therapy begins, by the way, uh, as people start to make changes, they may sometimes move to isolate themselves, almost like a a script backlash against the change or a backlash against the script. Yeah. They move away from what was a support network to isolating themselves, believe it or not. And that's something I think a therapist always needs to look out for if they see the, the client somehow isolating themselves. Yeah. And of course, I, I can think, I'm thinking of one particular client here 
who I think came and I'm thinking particularly of this client who but I could think of many more but I'm thinking this one came into therapy the profile would be self-reliant loner started to make a lot of changes to the extent I decided they wouldn't be overwhelmed uh, if we put them into a small group because um, uh, I think they needed more interaction with people. And I started to see the changes. They started to isolate themselves more. They even moved in with, to a home share. And all the indicators for changes in mental health started to be more positive. And then we started to see, believe it or not, and if it was after a dramatic piece of therapy, they started to change again and they were more unkempt. They moved out of the shared house. They started to not find being in a group very positive of themselves. And we need to know, we need to notice these things as therapists. Mm. Yeah. This is an indicator that therapy isn't working. Yeah. Something's happening. And it's usually a rebelliousness against the change. Yeah. Yeah, because it is, it, you know, change change is difficult and scary. And, you know, often that's what happens. They'll go so far down the road and then come to an abrupt standstill and, you know, either need to just take it slower or it will take a backward step. I think I did that in, in therapy. It's like, you know, the old saying, one step forward and two steps backwards. It's kind of like, sometimes that's how it feels. Yeah. I, I, as I ran groups for a long time, and I want to do two podcasts, perhaps, you know, later on sometime, on relational group process one and relational group process, post, relational group process two. But I, I, but I was giving somebody supervision and they're just starting groups. And one of the things we talked about is what sort of people go into groups. Now, people who've been isolating themselves, you don't suddenly just tell them to go into groups. No. It's too overwhelming for them. They have to have some individual therapy, quite a lot of individual therapy with you first. And when you start to see those people make these changes, or when you start to see these people being able to accept what I call positive strokes or positive recognition, without being overwhelmed. And when you see these pieces, people start to increase their support network or go to the theater or go to the dance hall or um, go out with friends. So their behavior starts changing and usually their self care starts to change. Then you may start thinking about the usefulness of a group. Yeah. Because it's a bit, it's a big difference in individual therapy and, and group therapy. The group therapy can often be the transition from individual therapy and going into the world. Yeah, I, being totally honest now, I found it really easy to hide in group therapy, <laughs> mm. and I was quite happy to hide in group therapy for many a week. <laughs> yeah. And some people don't go into group therapy and some people go into group therapy and hide in group therapy. But, you, but what I'm saying is I think group therapy can be very useful as a transition yeah. and interact and experiment with all these changes before yeah. they go leave therapy and go into, ther go into their own world in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because again, it's a safe space. Yeah, but what usually happens for somebody who's made all these changes that space. It's something the therapist needs to be very careful about and check out and think about changes and think about these things because if they then move that person who's made all these changes and suddenly they're in their group and they feel so overwhelmed, it can be counterproductive yeah. and they'll start to go backwards. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's also... So to, I don't want to say safety concerns, but 
being highlighted that if if they don't have anybody you know at home if there isn't a support network i know we touched on it a few podcasts ago but i always make sure i have an emergency contact number you know what about the the clients that haven't got anybody that you know uh, that, that suddenly stopped coming to therapy maybe and we don't know what's happened where they are whether they're okay or anything there's, there's also those sort of concerns with clients that are quite isolated absolutely absolutely and you know we need to do all the things that you've just said by the way have emergency phone numbers think what, find ways that we can contact them yeah uh, all these things but there's, there's a fine line in not being responsible for the client and ethically being mindful of, especially if, like you said, there's been a traumatic episode or whatever in a therapy session and then they don't come back or they've taken a backward step or whatever and you've noticed a change in the behaviour. How far do we go as therapists? That's interesting. If you talk to most people who come to issues like this and bring them to supervision, Usually, nine out of ten therapists do feel responsible for their clients. Yeah, yeah. Now I hear what you say, but it isn't. It isn't a job for therapists to be responsible for their clients. I understand that balance you're talking about, and I still think we need to be aware of the journey the client's taken to be where they are at that moment in therapy. Yeah. You see, I often think therapists are too, too eager, or some of them, too eager to uh, for the person to change. And they miss what's happening on the inside of the client. And, you know, I, I think they can adapt to the clients so quickly that the person may miss um, what's happening on the inside. Yeah. Yeah, because we we don't know what's going on on the inside. We can't we can't see. So you know, for something for us that might be an everyday occurrence for a client, might have a significance to them that you know the reaction is completely different to ours. In 1945, Eric Byrne, the transaction, you know, yeah, it was 1945. The originator of, um, of TA. He was a psych. He was a psychiatrist in the army, and T. A. was born out of the idea that by observing people's behaviours, you can make hypothesis about what ego state they've moved to. In other words, by observing external behaviours or the manifestation of external behaviours, you can hypothesise about what's happening internally. Yeah. And TA is born from that idea. So as TA therapists, I, would, I think we've got a head start on a lot of therapists. Yeah. We should be looking for the behavioral signals that indicate script change and what ego state they're in. Yeah. Yeah. We should really keen on looking through observation um, behavioral change or not yeah i think i think that's that's really important and to be mindful of making assumptions or presumptions about a person's behavior because we've all got our own past as well and we might think oh well Last time somebody behaved that way, it meant X, Y, and Z. That's not necessarily always going to be the case. That's right. I, I, I've had quite a few letters and emails from past clients over my clinical journey. Um, and the majority of them have been positive. And I had one the other day from somebody who said something like, you know, he probably won't remind me, remember me, it's a quarter of a century ago. Wow. Did a year's therapy with you and um, you were so important to me and I would like you to just know that. Oh, uh, that's lovely. Yeah, I, 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 that makes me remind, remind why I'm in this, the job I'm in. 
and uh, I think I remember the person. I mean, it's going back a quarter of a century. Um, but I probably, I think it's probably through this, that I don't, I haven't put as much emphasis as perhaps I could have done in you know, the importance of their changes. In other words, I've understood they've changed. I've understood their life has changed. And perhaps I never knew how much internal change happened. Yeah, yeah. You're right, it's quite hard to know what's happening internally. Yeah. I know Eric Byrne, um, from his first writings, Intuition Psychotherapy, to his fourth, first book in 1961, TA Psychotherapy, and onwards, would talk and emphasise deeply that observation and put a real premium on TA therapists observing what's happening with behaviour so they could hypothesise what ego state the person had moved to. Yeah. And then from there, treatment can happen. Yeah. It, it, it makes sense. So, so, for example, somebody who isolates themselves or is, like I say, a self-reliant loner, though it might not mean a lot to somebody, sorry, a therapist, but a small thing like, say, for example, somebody coming in and talking about their needs or talking about how they've missed somebody or talking about what they remember from last week or talk to you about, do you know I was thinking this? They're all big things mm. of somebody having the motivation to reach out. And I think the therapist needs to really um, share with the isolated person the impact of, you know, what they're having on them. Yeah. Now, with that comes the caveat of overwhelming someone. Yes. But understanding that, that concept of the isolated person being overwhelmed by the yeah. recognition or the way we were talking about. I think about. that's a really valid point because it can be, even just a small recognition can be overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. This, this is... This is all what TA is built on, though, I think. Mm. It's the analysis of internal and external transactions. Well, first of all, it's the analysis of external transactions to get to the internal transactions. Because external transactions, external transactions are the manifestation of internal transactions. In other words, something is happening on the inside. Yeah. Then you can ask them. Yeah. Where that you were talking about how you felt, and I, I realised that's the first time in three months you've ever talked about what you're feeling. You know, and has that meant that there's been things happening for you in your world at home? X X X X. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it, it, it's it's really it kind of goes in when when changes in behaviour are noticed and seen. You know, the the client feels like they've been seen and heard, and things like that. Providing it isn't like you said too overwhelming for them. Well, it it will be overwhelmed for them, but I think it's the job of the therapist to be aware of what's happening. And I don't like the word drip feed. But to, to just, you know, gently perhaps yeah. make a transaction which, you know, you might know is too overwhelming for them or might be. So you say, and you know, when I say this to you, about, I really appreciate you coming here every week. Is this too overwhelming for you? Do you yeah. move away from that transaction? when I say it at an internal level. Yeah. You check out what's happening internally in response to the external transaction. 
Yeah, because, it, you know, particularly I would imagine with somebody who is, a, a, you know, a loner, that it's a very slow process, very slow process. Very yeah. slow. Yeah. 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 Because and they, even to be in a room for 50 minutes with somebody and having a communication, I would imagine would be quite exhausting for them. <laughs> it's not yeah. something that they would do regularly. Yeah. They go home to four bare walls. Yeah, yeah. They go home to silence. Yeah. Their comfort is silence often. So to actually make a positive transaction is deafening to them. Yeah, because when we you first said this this topic, my interpretation of it was, you know, in the therapy room, having the client who was isolated in the therapy room rather than in the outside world. You know, the one that kind of shuts down or, or disconnects or whatever it is in the therapy room. That's another complete way. Well, that's another complete story. But let's let's approach that story. So people will only isolate themselves, shut down for a reason. Yeah. yeah. But somebody that's isolated outside is more likely to do it in the therapy room as well. If they're feeling overwhelmed, if it's too much. It was when you were saying about going home to silence and, you know, that being quite comforting for them. Well, in well, the therapy room, it would probably be comforting for them too. I was just pondering on the word most likely that you said there. I was pondering whether it was more likely. I think it's more familiar. Yeah. What you're talking about is very important, though, and that is the person who closes down, cuts off, withdraws, and isolates themselves from you or others in a group. Yeah. Now that is a that is a really big signal, or should be for the therapist, that something is happening. Yeah. Like a red flag, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's uh, been a shift of something going on. Yeah. Usually a shift in ego states and TXS. Yeah. And the therapist, it's really, really important for the therapist to inquire. Mm. Well, what's happening for you? You seem to have moved away from me. Is that is that true? Not to make an assumption. Yeah. yeah. Check out the assumption. You seem to have moved away from me. Is that true? So the client said, yes. And then you don't stop. You say, wow. Could you tell me a little bit more behind the word yes? What's actually happening at the moment? So it's the job of the therapist to be aware of the change and for the therapist to inquire. Yeah. Yeah. And again, very delicately without blaming and shaming or anything like that, because, you know, when they are seen, it can be quite overwhelming the fact that somebody's noticed that they've disconnected or whatever, yeah. Well, these are the pivotal moments in therapy. Yeah, absolutely. We are talking about pivotal moments in the therapy process. What happens behind closed doors? What does the therapist do? And you are completely correct. The therapist needs to inquire and attune sensitively. Mm. Yeah. They need to inquire and inquire and inquire and inquire. Yeah, because it, 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 there's something as well about not mimicking their behavior, but being on the same energy level maybe sometimes is what the client is. I know you like pacing and things like that, but if you've got a, you know, an isolated client who's quite withdrawn and, and quiet and everything. For me, it's important that I come in at that energy level rather than being completely exuberant and over the top. I'd frighten the life out of them. Oh, well, you know, I'm a fan of attunement, don't you? Yes, yes. I'm yes. a fan of accurate pacing and attuning to where the client is. And of course, that means energetic attunement. Yeah. Not yeah, absolutely. What you've just said there. If you did what you've just said there, you would lose the person in front of you. They would close down. They go underground, and you perhaps might never know what's happened. But I do know one thing: 
that therapy will happen. Yeah. The defences will just come up and you'll lose the client. Yeah. So the, there's a skill, a definite skill, and I know like you touched on it being behind the therapy room doors, but when people say, oh, you just chat, you just sat in a room and you're just chatting, there's so many different levels to everything that's going on in that that room. When I first took up therapy training, I thought I'll be quite good at this because I'd had a year of my own therapy by then. Yeah. And I don't know if I thought I'd be just good at chatting. Yeah. Probably a bit that way around. Um, I don't know if I've ever thought of it that way around, but either way, but you are correct. You know, it's like if you're going to just chat or pass time, therapy will never bloody happen. It, <laughs> it's a skill. It's a way of thinking. It's about uh, attuning by involving, inquiring, and thinking about the external and internal worlds of the person in front of you. Yeah. Now that's a way of thinking, a therapeutic stance, and actually it's a way of training. In other words, you need to be trained to start thinking this way, and then the experience starts to... I was just about to say that and a lot of experience in it, because we, we do get it wrong sometimes and we do make mistakes. Oh, I think I think it's ine inevitable in the human encounter. Yeah. I think on another past podcast, we do so many, I made a plea for, you know, ruptures and uh, being able to recover from mistakes. Yeah. Um, inquiring what's happening. Yeah. To sort of pretend they've never happened. Yes, it's yeah, yeah. Mistake has happened. Yeah. This was about. Um, uh, and I think with these types of clients we're talking about, people who, you know, clients that isolate themselves, you need a lot of patience. Mm. That is very slow by definition. Yeah. Because they may over feel overwhelmed, shut down internally, and you might never know. Yeah. Yeah. But again, wonderful work can be done if you see somebody coming out of their shell, you know, and, and being more connected and you know less isolated it, it is it is wonderful to see somebody yeah but you do, what you don't do is say hi in a very exuberant way it's really yeah. good to see you and that is a complete opposite of what you do yeah you need to quite gently and go to the same energetic attunement that you talked about there's a lot of work to be done but the skill mm -hmm. is a recognizing you know the external movement yeah or the internal change yeah and for somebody to come into a therapy room and and you know take up space is 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 you know wonderful really yeah i could talk about this forever but i i, I come from a frame in my life where well you know uh I, isolation was my home yeah, I'm the opposite, Bob. I don't like silence. I don't like quiet. No, I don't mean Very now. Very uncomfortable for me. I don't mean now. Yeah. About for the first 15 years of my life, isolation was my home out of necessity. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. It, wasn't a, it was a choice because to be the opposite was like an alien world. Yeah, I think what you know, if you, you have had that experience, then you are more easily attuned to somebody and understand the reasons why maybe somebody does that. And yeah, for me, I, I, I refer to myself more recently as an introverted extrovert, <laughs> it, it depends literally, I can be one way or the other. Well, I certainly wish I'd had the choice to be like that, but for survival's sake, I couldn't be. I had to remain hidden. Because oh. we're sort of talking about it, usually for these types of people, we talk about the hidden self. Yes, yeah. Yeah. What a wonderful podcast. For one I know. Number 
101. 101, yes. So what we're going to talk on 102 is how to confront <laughs> clients. That will be an interesting one. Oh, that, yeah. How we work with the techniques, if you want to call them techniques anyway, with the style of confrontation. Yeah. Yeah. That's I'll be interested one. in that. That's the next one, is it? That's the next one. That's what I've got written down for the next one. I'm going to look forward to that. Yeah. Okie doke. Right. Until next time, Bob. See you next time. Bye bye. See you soon. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.